I'm a human being that has seen a mistake. I'm a human being that has suffered on both sides because of this type of mistake. And again, I'll tell you what, like my daddy says, when, when you have something going on that's a problem, you can either be a part of the problem or a part of the solution. I'm trying to be a part of the solution in this. I've been involved with the palace almost three years now, and I've been actively helping felons coming out of prison 17 years. When I moved into the uh, palace, um, we found the uh, park in disarray. There was a lot of domestic violence going on, drugs. It was quite a wild place. What we were thinking is if we could bring people in, quiet it down, get rid of the drugs, that we might be able to turn this place into not a haven and definitely not a palace, but you know, a, a decent place to live where somebody could come, lay their head down at night and maybe pick up the pieces of their lives and rebuild. Used to be in the old days, uh, we heard that the man came out of prison, he'd have $200 and a brand new suit. That doesn't happen anymore. Um, he's coming out of prison, he's a sex offender, the lowliest of the low. It, it's pretty tough. And we have to try to give them back some dignity. So with that um, comes success. I guess the whole problem was I took my whole family for granted. And, you know, figured they'd always be there for me and figured that love was good enough. But I guess I was wrong, so I got to backtrack and start over and do what a father and a dad's supposed to do now. Well, the, the charge was a lewd and lascivious exhibition with a computer. And it basically it happened because I was more drunk than I should have been. And uh, I was talking to two other women besides the 14-year-old, well, what I thought was a 14-year-old. and The one didn't think I was drunk enough to expose myself, so I told the 14-year-old that I was going to do it, and I told her if it offended her to turn the camera off. And anyway, that's pretty much what happened, and they came and arrested me, and I did three and a half months in jail. But yeah, I'm, I'm sorry I did it, and you know, I'm glad it wasn't a 14-year-old girl, but I just wish it wasn't a cop at the other end. <laughs> my, my arrest affidavit said victim unknown, which there wasn't a victim besides a cop, but the, the, the actual victims are now my, my family because they have to suffer right along with me. Let's see, my wife Stephanie. She can be a bit of a bully sometimes, but she's a great woman. She's a great mother. I have known her now for 15 years. We've been dating her since I was 14 and she was 15. It was pretty rough the first half of our relationship. I cheated on her once every couple of years and I was still in the departing and everything. And she left me twice and I apologized and we made up and we got together again. And I feel really, really horrible for neglecting them and staying out all night partying when I should have been working or at home with the family. I don't suggest being an alcoholic to nobody. It ruins your relationships and ruins your life. I'm just trying everything I can to show her that I still love her and how sorry I am for everything I've done. And I'm impressed, actually, that she's still with me. <laughs> she doesn't condone what I did, but she's not going to condemn me for the rest of my life over it. My daughter, Tiffany, she's 10 years old now. She's not doing too great in school anymore. She's got, I guess, a lot of issues going on because of everything that's happening, but... My daughter knows about it, uh, that her dad did something really stupid and had to go to jail for a while. She now understands that I'm not allowed around other kids besides her and my son. They just know there's a lot of stuff that we can't do no more that we used to do. My son, he's only four. He, I, don't, I don't think he knows much of the difference because before I went to jail, I was working third shift at Walmart, so I just tell him I'm going, going to work, but he's catching on that I'm, I'm not now, so. But he's still too young to understand. Anyway, I'm here because I got a uh, 10 o'clock curfew and I also have the 1,000 foot rule. So I come here at night about 9, 9.30, watch wrestling or whatever's on TV for about a half hour and then pass out. And I wake up between 5 and 5.30 every morning, go to my wife's house and either go to work from there or hang out with her and the kids all day. Come 9 o'clock, I pretty much come back here and do it all over again. My wife and I, we've been sending a letter to the judge and the state's attorney for the last two months and finally I got a uh, court date. I get a whole 15 minutes to explain to the judge why I should be able to move back in with my wife and children. And we drove down there, got lost in Bartow, finally figured out where we was going, got there, missed the court date, so we had to drive around for another hour or so. Made it back in the rain just in time to hear the judge say he can't do nothing about it. 
I guess he had had a, uh, another case previously that he gave permission to a fella and the state pitched a fit about it and made him overturn his decision. I guess once you're in the system, you're pretty well screwed for life. There's not a feeling like standing in that cold courtroom and, you know, having somebody pronounce that your life is over. I was um, charged with a lewd and lascivious molestation, although I've not touched anybody. She tried to touch me. I put a stop to it. She didn't like it, I guess, and uh, comes out to find out that uh, what I'd found out later is, is that I had forced her to um, masturbate me into ejaculation. The story is very much fabricated. It's my wife's cousin. I told her, I said, look, I said, I'm not gonna mention this to anybody. I'm gonna pretend like it didn't happen. Possibly, looking back, I should have straight away mentioned it, at least to my wife. And in the meantime, my wife had talked to the, the young lady's parents and told, and she was told that if I would go and talk to them, and confess to this that they would drop all charges. Well, I was recorded and then the next day I was arrested. To be honest, before all this happened, I had a very comfortable life. I worked hard to get what I got. Went to school for accounting, got a doctor of pharmacy. I worked seven days a week. I worked at a hospital and at Walgreens. So everything was great. Why would I throw it away? These guys, including me, monitored forever, for life. That's one of the things I'm angry about too. It makes you feel as though you're like an animal being tagged, I guess you could say. Well, as far as a sex offender, if you're charged with that, it's just all under some blanket uh, thing. I feel they should, they should break that down into people who are, uh, you know, considered a threat, non-threat, what have you. And also, would you believe that murderers they don't have to register like we do to spend the rest of their life like some kind of bug under a microscope. They can live anywhere, go anywhere, do anything. I'm just shocked at it because what's worse than taking a life? Being here, I'd say it can, do, it can be positive on people because it shows you the kind of lifestyle that you don't want to have because I don't want to be labeled as a sex offender. I don't want to have to live in a certain place. I don't want to have to be, you know, careful of where I go because I feel that I am not a threat to anybody. And I want my life back. I want justice. Sex offenders are considered untreatable, and that's totally false. I've worked with many different populations. The sex offenders are probably easier to work with than most of the other populations I've dealt with. They are um, appreciative that people care about them. Remember, they've, they've been, in many ways, dejected and rejected. They've never really experienced that kind of caring before. I think the sex offenders are, for the most part, untreated victims in many ways. The public has been totally duped into believing they're incorrigible and hopeless. There's a side of the system that's benefiting uh, their law enforcement agenda. A lot of people are making a lot of money. Uh, it gets people elected. There's complicated reasons why the truth is not being told. There's a side of our culture that likes to punish. There have always been classes of people that we have persecuted. And the sex offenders kind of fit in there. You know, they're the, the modern day boogeymen. But the public needs to know most of them are not out there looking for more victims. Their relapse rates are very low. Most of them are not dangerous. The Justice Department study 
conducted about six years ago indicated their relapse rates are between 5 and 12 percent after their release from prison. I can tell you just about any other criminal class is a lot higher than that. One of the hardest things I've ever done, and that's including uh, all of the Vietnam stuff, was having to call my youngest daughter the day before Thanksgiving in 2005 and to tell her I was in jail for child pornography. When I got my computer, I went to www.whitehouse.com to see something. I was checking up something on Bush. And when it went to that, it was a porn site. And this immediately hit me, you know, very strange. Because a lot of kids probably try that website too, you know, have some kind of civil government class at school or something. And, and from there, you can, you know, link out to all these various uh, porn sites. Basically, I created a disc with a bunch of different pornography on it. It was kind of a potpourri of stuff you can see and like I say I find a link to some child porn and unfortunately I did put some of that on my disc. After I started on it I was going to you know, mail it to the St. Petersburg Times and you know, I was showing what all your kids could be you know, watching. That's basically why I download most of any of it. Right now I'm, just, I'm on probation. I'm partially disabled Vietnam vet. I'm kind of an isolationist. I don't get out much. It's a boring life, but it's a simple life. Well, living here among, I don't know, 90 or 100 or so sex offenders, you know, at first it kind of bothered me because in the meetings, you know, everybody had to state your name and explain what you did and everything. And it made me pretty uh, nervous to listen to all this. I could see where, you know, the community around could, you know. I know if I was out there in their position, you know, and I looked up on the things and the guy just moved in next door to the sex offender, yeah, it would probably bother me a lot. So, I feel sad that this happened to me. I feel like, you know, I just feel like I'm in a sorry state you know, in my life, you know, where I shouldn't be. But I'm making the best of it, you know, following all the rules and just trying to do my five years probation and move on. You have no choice but to pay attention to me. You know what I mean? I leave you no choice. You're going to notice me because I am going to be make sure that I am noticed. You know? That's right. Now I got arrested because I was going with a, oh, uh, I think my girl was 14, 15. I can't remember, man, I, I can't even remember that far back. I had just turned 18. What happened was, her dad, you know, pressed charges on me. Yeah, I was sleeping with her, of course. That's my girl. What are we supposed to do? Go play jumping jacks and jump rope and stuff? <laughs> Go to the movies? <laughs> then the uh, incident came up with my um, cousin. We was outside playing, and I was like, fucked up. And I know I kicked, I, we was kicking the soccer ball. And then all of a sudden, like a few minutes later, whatever, I know I had kicked my cousin. I kicked her between her legs. It was an accident. I didn't mean to do it. Or nothing like that. She was t she was ten years old. She was like she was real short or whatever, right? But and I don't I don't I know I remember kicking her, but I I was like man, you know what I mean. So I just went to like check her out, you know, to make sure she was okay, you know what I mean? Cause I kicked her really 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 hard, you know what I mean? Really hard. And yeah, I touched her, you know what I mean? I touched her, but not in no kind of like sexual way. I was eighteen when I first went in there. If I wouldn't have went to prison, 
for whatever, I don't care whatever charge it could have been. You know what I mean? I probably would have either be dead right now or I probably have a life sentence because I was just starting to really get my mind on like getting on into the drug game. Oh yeah, I, shit, I feel fine. I feel fine living here, right? It doesn't matter if it was 900 sex offenders living here. People say, yeah, sex offender. When you, when you hear the word sex offender, they're like, oh my God, this fucking, this child molester, we gotta stay away from this person, we gotta stay away from that person, man. No, it's not like that. Yeah, they got us labeled, it's all oh, man, oh, this is the pervert part. They say this is the pervert part, this is this and that, right? Okay, that's how you feel. That's how you feel. I can't change the way you feel, right, about the place. And I can't change the way you feel about me. I go wherever I go, and everybody that I meet, I let them know, hey, yeah, I'm sex offender, I'm on sex offender probation, da da da, this is what I do. And they're like, most of them don't have no problem with it. I don't have nothing to hide. And I, really, everybody should be the same way. If you got something to hide, then it's like, I can see why somebody would want to watch you or something, you know what I mean? I like to clown a lot, and I talk a lot of shit. I play around and joke, so I make people laugh. I'm the shit right now because I got so much stuff going on. I got so many friends. Everybody wants to meet this guy. Everybody wants to talk to Julian. And me, I'm a sex symbol. You know what I mean? Why can't I be on the front of GQ magazine? Why not? I don't think I'm all that. You know what I mean? But I am some of that. You know what I mean? <laughs> uh. Why? Why would I have an interest in this? Well, actually I have multiple reasons. One is uh, that my own son was an offender. As I spoke with my son and things started to come out in the open, I started sharing and looking upon my own life, uh, my own secrets. Um, not that I was offending anybody, but that I had been offended. I had an uncle um, he was my youngest uncle through marriage. He had married uh, my aunt who was within my age and he was like very dashing and I, I just felt so comfortable about him. And one day he came in and I was raped by this uncle. Uh, it was very difficult. I was eight years old and did not understand all this. Um, I did go to my parent and I did tell, I went to my mother and I told her what happened. and. She looked at me as if, like, maybe I was just telling a story. Years went by, and of course, then the situation with my son arose. When I knew that he was going to be coming home, I knew that he was going to be facing mandatory treatment. And I met another man who was a sex offender. I asked him if I could go to his treatment class so that I could have some idea of what they were doing, what they were talking about. I wanted to know what would make them hurt, an eight-year-old innocent girl who did nothing. Most of the people that look at me look at me as a person with five heads. Why would I want to help sex offenders when I was offended myself? And basically what I answer is, you know, I, I really don't do this for the sex offenders. I do it for the community. I don't feel that continually punishing them is going to make, uh, make our community safer against sex offenders. I do believe that if we can help them to be more productive in having uh, healthy lifestyles, that can help the community.